Hi, sorry. My name is Max McManus, and there was a little mic thing going on backstage, so I'm a little late, and I might be fidgeting with this. But I want to start with a little bit of audience participation and interaction. So I want to see a show of hands if any of you have ever been to a country outside of the United States. That is most of us. Like, I'm seeing pretty much every hand up, right? Now, my next question is I want to see your hand go up if one of those countries you've been to was a country that didn't speak English as its primary language. That's still most of us nice. Now, here's my big finale to these questions. I want you to put your hand up if, when you were in one of these countries that didn't speak English, you pretty much genuinely spoke that other language that wasn't English. Not just being able to ask for the bathroom, but like able to communicate. How many of us were there? So that's a lot less of us, right? Now. I want us to imagine all the stories we could have collectively learned if we were able to speak that language. Stories are how we pass down our history, and they're so incredibly important because they are how we express ourselves. Every family has histories, regardless of where they're from. But unfortunately for many of us, these histories tend to be lost, and my family does fall into this category. I don't know how most of my ancestors ended up in the United States. The United States itself were built on immigration. George Washington even wrote in 1783 that the bosom of America is open to receive not only the respected stranger, which is, I just I forgot the actual quote, stranger, but I'm paraphrasing now, the respected stranger, but the oppressed and persecuted of all nations. Almost every one of us are an immigrant to this country. The only people who have genuinely never immigrated to America are the Native Americans and Native Hawaiians. All of us have immigrated into yeah, their yeah. land, and many of us white Americans tend to forget that. Myself, my family, they were immigrants at one point too, evidently, but I don't know how most of them got here, and I wanna know why they took these actions. Okay, I, okay. I wanna know why they gave up their languages, their homes, their sense of security and knowing where they were and knowing the people they were around. They gave up everything in order to move to a new continent and to a new country where everything was completely different. I knew the answers from history textbooks, but I didn't understand in my soul why they were willing to take these steps. I knew that historically there were waves of German immigration after conflict with the French. And I knew that in Ireland, after the British started shipping away the Irish food to their own cities, there was widespread death, poverty, and famine. But I didn't understand in my soul the impact that these things would truly have. I long to have a connection to those cultures, but other than the names that my family and I carry, I have nothing to prove that I am German or Irish. I know that my last name is McManus, so I have to be Irish, but I have nothing to prove it. My mom's last name is Barch, so I must be German, but I have nothing to prove it. I long to have that connection to a culture and a thing, a greater thing that I am part of, but I don't get to have that because my family decided to immigrate. And I want to know why they were so willing to throw away everything and come to this country. I didn't really understand how this would happen until I learned Spanish, coincidentally. And I grew up on the border of Mexico, and I was always very interested in Spanish. So it seemed in a way like my destiny to learn this language. From a very young age, I would hear my dad speaking to other cowboys on my farm and identify they were speaking Spanish. And then I would repeat the phrase, no hablo espanol, which means I don't speak Spanish until I was acknowledged. And I would go up to Mexican students at my school and I would point at random things and say, como se dice, which means how do you say, in an aim to improve my vocabulary. And I even tried a very primitive version of Duolingo back in like 2012. But the only phrase I learned how to say was, El hombre come una manzana, which means the man eats an apple. So, I don't know, I was learning some pretty high level Spanish, so I hope no one's jealous of me there. But even though I didn't actually speak Spanish, like many of the people I met while I was living on the border, I started to understand their stories. And in all honesty, I saw some very terrible things while I was there. Living so close to the border meant that people illegally crossing would end up on my property. And I saw some really sad things. They were out of food, they were dehydrated, they were disoriented, and their shoes were disintegrating. 
I saw mothers carrying their babies through the desert, hoping to make it somewhere in the northern United States to discover they had only made it 40 miles past the border. And not everyone even made it that far. Some people died and other people couldn't keep going, so they turned themselves into Border Patrol and were shipped back to whatever country they had originally come from. I wanted to know how this could happen. These people were risking everything and killing themselves to find a better life. And as I started to get a little older, I started to understand why. I started to learn the history. And what I saw was a picture eerily similar to what had happened in Ireland when my family was there. Imperialism. So, in North and South America, these countries were colonized by European powers, the same as what happened to Ireland. When the English came into Ireland, this is where they developed their tactic of imperialism and colonialism, which we so famously see in places like India and South Africa and Australia. These were perfected in Ireland and Canada as well. And furthermore, just like when the English and Spanish went into North and South America, when the British came in to Ireland, they deemed it as this pristine, untouched place with nobody living there, despite there being over a million residents living in Ireland at the time. And in the country south of the border, they didn't have this nice, pristine history like a lot of people think as well. It was hard there. From the time that the conquistadors came into South America, Exploitation was rampant, starting with the exploitation of indigenous labor and then African slave labor. These uh, systems of exploitation persist to this day in the economies and social structures that, despite being founded in the colonial era, are still present. And furthermore, in the 19th and 20th century, when the U.S. started becoming a world power, we started to exercise our power over these countries in the form of policies that like, supported us instead of the people there. It was for U.S. government and economic interest at the risk and at the like, expense of these countries. And as I was getting a little bit older and starting to listen to the news, I started to realize what the people around me were saying about these immigrants that I had met. They said that they were murderers. They were drug runners. They were evil people who were coming to destroy everything holy and sacred about America. They called them illegal aliens. Now. In the mind of a child, hearing someone be called an alien holds a different connotation than it does to adults. As adults, we know that it means someone who is foreign and to an extent different. But as a child, it means someone who is so different from us that they might be this grotesque monster that has come to harm us. They might not be human. And this confused me. Because none of the immigrants I had met had been these evil, disgusting people. They were always kind. And furthermore, my mom was an immigrant from Canada. But in my mind, immigrating from Canada and Mexico meant the same thing. I wanted to know why these people thought my mom was an evil alien. And I wanted to know why my mom was treated better than the other immigrants I had met. And for a time, I stopped thinking about immigration once I moved here to Maui from Arizona because I felt like I myself had immigrated. I was thrown into this new climate and culture and I didn't know anyone around me and I had no connection to where I was. But as I started to feel comfortable and come into myself again, I started to hear the same things on the news. They were saying the same things about immigrants. And I was so angry at everybody. How could everybody be so stupid? I wanted to know had they never met anyone from Mexico or Nicaragua or any of the various countries represented in the waves of immigration I saw on the southern border? But as I started to look around, I realized they didn't have the same experiences as me. They didn't meet these kind of immigrants. And I felt crushed and frustrated because I was a child. Adults wouldn't listen to me. They wouldn't be able to learn from me. I couldn't teach them that these people were normal and looking for a better life. But the thing that I had been looking for to be able to express these ideas soon came to me. I took my first Spanish class. And I'm gonna be really, really honest, I was genuinely one of the worst Spanish students you have ever met in your life when I took that class. Like, it was really, really bad. While other students were learning how to conjugate their verbs, I memorized sentences in full and certain vocabulary words to pass me through the year. I learned almost nothing in those classes. But 
once I got to high school, I learned that I could actually learn Spanish and that I really enjoyed it. And through this new vigor, I kept going every year of my high school curriculum, even while my friends were dropping the class because they wanted another study hall or because they didn't like Spanish. I kept going. And in my junior year, I even had the opportunity, opportunity to travel to Costa Rica with a group of students at my school. And it was completely in Spanish. Um, I stayed with a host family and went to school and everything. But when I said it was completely in Spanish, I mean completely in Spanish. My host mother spoke zero English. And it wasn't just her that I struggled to communicate with. It was every single person I met, except for three European boys who I met. And they saw me. And they looked me up and down. They're like, you're a foreigner. Come be friends with us. Other than those three European boys, I couldn't speak my first language fluently with anyone. And this made me uncomfortable because I couldn't express my ideas. But as I thought about how uncomfortable I was in Costa Rica, I was able to think back to when I was in Arizona and the Mexican students at my school. And then I thought bigger picture of all the immigrant children who didn't speak English. And I thought of their parents who couldn't learn a language as easy as their children could, who had lived in their country for 20, 30, 40 or more years and were suddenly in this new climate where they couldn't speak the language and they didn't know anyone and how uncomfortable and out of place they must have felt. I was able to leave after a week and come back to Maui and speak my first language and be at home where I feel comfortable. But the people who immigrated didn't have that same opportunity as me. But despite how uncomfortable I was, I realized I really, really, really love Costa Rica. They were some of the kindest people I had ever met there. They were always laughing and smiling and having fun with each other. And furthermore, I felt safe there. In the United States, I often don't feel safe when I come into new spaces because to many people, when you look at me, I am obviously queer identifying with my long hair and sometimes I have painted nails. But when I was in Costa Rica, I felt safe because it was so different. With kids my own age, my gender and sexuality didn't matter. And furthermore, the culture around it was different. I would see these super like hyper-masculine guys playing soccer with their bros and like beating each other up. And then the next period, the same guys were kissing their boyfriends in the hallways and classrooms. It was like I had never seen anything like that before. It was bizarre. Um, but I loved the culture, and I knew I needed to go back. And luckily, the summer before my senior year, I had an opportunity to go back with my dad. And I went to a Spanish school that was aimed at specifically learning Spanish. And by the time I went back, I actually considered myself fluent in Spanish at the time. And not to brag, but I was put in the highest level Spanish class at the school. And it was me and this one like 23-year-old girl from Switzerland in that class. Like, It was a really small class, but because of how small it was, I got to learn from my teachers a little bit more and learn about their stories. One teacher was an immigrant from Nicaragua, and the other was an immigrant from Venezuela. And even though I was learning grammar and stuff, like learning the connotations, the many different past tense forms hold in Spanish, or learning about relative pronouns, I also learned about the Reagan administration's involvement in Nicaragua. Even though I was practicing speaking Spanish by doing little improv scenes, like trying to convince my husband to go see a psychiatrist before he goes on vacation, I was also learning about the abject poverty so many people in Venezuela experience. And these stories that I heard were all the more impactful to me because it was the first time I heard these stories from someone I personally knew. There was a personal connection between me and my teachers. And furthermore, I heard these stories completely in Spanish, which was their first language and the language they experienced these stories in. So it was all the more true to them. And once I came back to the United States and started my AP Spanish and Language Culture course this year, I started to delve specifically into the history of Latin America. And what I discovered was very troubling. Almost every single problem with the immigration crisis we see today was because of the United States. We have involved ourselves in these countries for years and years and years in the form of military invasions and coup d'etats and economic embargoes, everything you can think of, we have put onto these countries, and then we blame them when they come to us. One of the things I learned about in the year before and also this year was 
the Monroe Doctrine, which is one of the first examples of the U.S. exerting its power over the Latin American countries. And on paper, the Monroe Doctrine was a thing to protect Latin America from European powers involving themselves. But in actuality, the Monroe Doctrine so, uh, was a justification for U.S. interventionalism. And our interventions took many, many forms, like some of the things I mentioned, like coup d'etats and military operations, but there was CIA interventions and everything that you can think of. We pushed ourselves over them. Economic policies that only benefited us. Everything. In Central America, there were so many corporations that were there in the fruit companies and mining, and we put in dictators and overthrew democratically elected governments, which is very un-American, if you say, because we're so pressed about our democracy. We overthrew democratic elections and put in dictators that served only to help us in our economic interests, in our government, in our businesses. And so many of these countries in Central America have had these interventions that have caused widespread violence and poverty and death. And there's dictators that have just taken over. We have overthrown governments over and over and over in Chile and Brazil and everywhere, even outside of the United States, we keep overthrowing governments. That's not nice. But most of these things that I learned are too violent to share on this stage. Everything from the genocides in Guatemala to the banana wars, everything is so incredibly violent. But one of the things I do feel comfortable talking about is the Reagan administration's involvement in Nicaragua. What I learned, and partially from research and partially from my teacher in Costa Rica, was that when the Reagan administration during the Iran-Contra affair started funneling millions of dollars into the Contras, who are a right-wing rebel group, in order to overthrow the Sandinista government, it caused violence. And my teacher in Costa Rica experienced this as a teenager. He told me that before the Sandinistas and Contras were fighting with each other, there were the Somozas, who were a government that was backed by the US. After 20 years of military occupation in Nicaragua. And we wanted to overthrow the, Som Som the Somosas there. And the Sandinistas were this people's party in a way that was made up of everyone. There were people from the city, there were students, people from the country and farmers all working together to overthrow the Somosas. And once that happened, everyone poured into the streets and they were crying and kissing each other and celebrating and dancing. And then for two years, they cooperated and it was relatively peaceful. But once Reagan came into power and started funneling money into the Contras to overthrow the Sandinistas, everything was thrown out the window. It was incredibly violent. And this is what my teacher experienced. People in the Contras would go in to these villages and areas and find children and teenagers and take them away and torture them and execute them for no reason, because they were young people. And my teacher was one of them. He was lined up in a line with other teenage boys and had a gun held to the back of his head to be executed. They decided not to because it, was, because it wasn't worth it. But what if that hadn't happened? I wouldn't have learned these things. And the more I looked, this keeps happening in so many countries and we don't realize it. We are causing this poverty and we're undermining the sovereignty of these regions and then one Immigrants come to our door and ask us for help and ask us for asylum and safety. We turn them away. We need to think back to how our families got to America. We were all immigrants at one point, too. And what would happen if we were turned away? If our families had to go back to wherever they were, if they were fleeing violence, if they were fleeing poverty, they might not have made it. We, not might, we might not be alive today. And what I encourage us all to do is when we meet immigrants, to learn their stories, have empathy with them, understand why they came here, because their stories are incredibly similar to the stories of many of us. Thank you. Mm -hmm.